Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ETO Journal Club. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Brahan Abudade from Mayo Clinic. He's a gastroenterologist, a specialist in bariatric endoscopy and endoscopy management of probiotic surgery complications. On this opportunity, he will present the paper published last October in Obesity Surgery Journal, whose title is Esophagitis After Bariatric Surgery, Large Cross Sectional Achievement of Endoscopy Database. Please remember, everyone can type questions to Dr. Bahan during the presentation. Welcome, Bahan. Please go ahead. Pedro, thank you so much for all your effort organizing this. And thank you, Manuela and EFSO, for this lovely uh, symposium to and journal club to present our work. <clears throat> Good morning from Rochester, Minnesota. It's uh, is about 10 degrees over here, and it's snowy. So if you're in a good climate, uh, enjoy it. So today we're going to talk about uh, our paper published in Obesity Surgery entitled uh, Esophagitis After Bariatric Surgery, Large Cross-Sectional Assessment of an Endoscopic Database. Uh, So to introduce the topic, as you know, uh, paralleling uh, the increase in uh, the obesity epidemic, there is an increase in obesity-related comorbidities. And uh, GERD uh, is uh, one of these uh, comorbidities that go hand in hand with obesity. Uh, that being said, Bariatric surgery does alter the physiology of the esophagus, GE junction, and the dynamic interaction between the esophagus and the stomach, thus theoretically could uh, alter multiple of the barrier for e reflux, and there has been an association between bariatric surgery and worsening in GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. If we look about uh, the physiology of what prevents reflux in normal anatomy, you could see it's orchestrated by this dynamic interaction between actually four things. One is the uh, main door, which is the GE junction. And the GE junction is a phenomena of, of two valves. One is the hiatus or the diaphragmatic hiatus, and the other one is the lower esophageal sphincter. So obviously this door is stayed, stays shut by both the hiatus of the diaphragm and the GE junction, and any of these alterations to the hiatus or to the, uh, to the uh, pressures on the lower esophageal sphincter could make this door partially open, conducive to reflux. That is part of the story, but not the entire story. Obviously you have components on both ends of the door. There is one end in the esophagus, and the esophagus motility is a very important anti-reflux mechanism. So if, if you are refluxing, most of us will reflux normally because of transient lower esophageal relaxation, but this reflux is not problematic because the esophagus, once it senses this tension, it's very good about clear, clearing the, what's refluxing, and therefore disorders that alter the motility of the esophagus in the long term could be conducive to the effects of acid reflux and to worsening acid reflux. So please do not forget about the clearance of the esophagus and esophageal motility as an important anti-reflux barrier. And that's going to be important for our discussion because now there is an emerging data showing that bariatric surgery could impact with, with long in the long term the motility of the esophagus. And thus, this becomes an important mechanism of why we see reflux after bariatric surgery. Now, the final uh, component of the anti-reflux mechanism is what's happening on the other side of the door, which is in the stomach. And obviously, if you alter the compliance or the pressures in the stomach, you are forcing the, the lower esophageal sphincter to be uh, hypotensive, and you are conducing uh, or you're inducing reflux by increasing the intra-abdominal pressure or the decreased compliance of the afterload in the esophagus, which is the stomach. 
Uh, and that's partially, you could see that in, in states of obesity. As you know, obesity is associated with reflux. And one of the big as reasons for the association is with increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, there's increase in the intragastric pressure that results or is more conducive to reflux. Now, if you look at bariatric surgery, the two most common operations, one is the sleeve gastrectomy, and the other is the row Y gastric bypass, and this is a cartoon depiction of both. You could see that hypothetically, the, these anatomic manipulation could affect all components of this equation. You could affect the hiatus, you could affect the lower esophageal sphincter's pressure, you could affect the compliance of the stomach that's changing the after load on the esophagus, and eventually because of this changes, the esophageal motility itself could be impacted. So the question is, in an operation that impact multiple physiological barriers for reflux, what's the impact of these procedures uh, on, on, on reflux? And as you know, which is an important part of our findings here, Roa gastric bypass has been uh, taunted as an anti-reflux procedure or as a cure of reflux. And here we're going to show data that, that would suggest that this is not completely true. It could improve reflux, but it could change reflux from one kind to another. And that's what we will give you some uh, suggestions on. So this is, I spent some time on this because that's a key understanding of the physiology that will put our findings into, into context or into light. So again, we talked about the difference alteration of the sleeve gastrectomy and the row Y gastric bypass that could be conducive to this reflux. So I'm not going to rehash this physiology. Uh, and I wanted to also limit to, to, uh, to put the previous literature into context. Uh, there's a lot of studies that discuss uh, this phenomena of increased reflux after bariatric surgery. Mostly it has been focused on sleeve rather than in row I guess, or bypass. But I could tell you that a lot of these studies have used subjective measures, and this is patient-reported symptoms, not objective measures such as pH data or, or confirmed subjective documentation of esophagitis. And you could argue that the presence of erosive esophagitis is the most sensitive and the most subject and uh, the most objective measure, because that means that multiple barriers have broken down and now you're alterating your lower esophagus because in the setting of the reflux. Uh, so in, as I told you, in the obese cohort, reflux is prevalent and erosive esophagitis is prevalent. So just to give you a context of interpreting our results, with obesity, the prevalence of, of erosive esophagitis in the literature have ranged between two to 18.7%. And that's not symptoms of reflux, that's the presence of erosive esophagitis on upper endoscopy. So once, once we go through our data, please keep this number, number in mind because whatever excess prevalence we're seeing is on top of this number. That's, that's almost the baseline for obese cohort uh, preoperatively. So the study aim was to investigate the prevalence of esophagitis in a large cohort of post-bariatric surgery patients who underwent an upper endoscopy. Then we wanted to take a deep dive into this phenomena and determine some of the physiological underpinning of reflux after sleeve gastrectomy, uh, because that's the timely topic. So we conducted a case-matched cohort study where we matched post-sleeve patients who had uh, both upper endoscopy and, and, and pH study to a preoperative cohort that also have upper endoscopy and pH study to try to see what's different, what's the differences in the physiology between obesity alone and obesity or treated obesity after sleep gastrectomy on the on these uh, anti-reflux uh, uh, barriers and the impact on erosive esophagitis. So the big study was cross-sectional, large database of endoscopic findings, and the sub-study was a case match cohort that took a deeper dive uh, into comparing the physiology between obesity alone and obesity after sleeve uh, gastrectomy impact on, uh, on uh, both pH and manometry uh, changes of the GE junction. 
So uh, we talked about the design. Uh, this was conducted at Mayo Clinic Hospitals, which is their tertiary care hospitals. Uh, and we have three locations. One is in Rochester, Minnesota, which I'm in, and the other is in, uh, in Arizona and Jacksonville, uh, Florida. Uh, this is the flow diagram of the study. We started with 870 patients that we reviewed who had upper endoscopy after bariatric surgery. Uh, we were very meticulous about excluding even the trivial anatomical abnormality. So somebody with a twist in the sleeve, minor uh, narrowing at the incisura, strictures, uh, ulcers, GI bleeding, any anatomical abnormalities of the, uh, uh, of, uh, of the sleeve or the roi gastric bypass, such as stenosis or stricture, was excluded uh, in order not to bias the results based on abnormal anatomy or anatomical complication of the surgery. Therefore, we ended up with 517 patients that essentially, other than the presence of esophagitis, had the normal uh, post-sleeve gastrectomy or roi gastric bypass anatomy. And the cohort panned out as 261 patients who underwent sleeve gastrectomy and 256 patients who underwent Rho and Y gastric bypass. So this, this is the data we collected. Basically, we took we collected a lot of the demographic information at baseline. Uh, we were also very meticulous about collecting information from all sources about the presence and the size of hiatal hernias, about preoperative GERD diagnosis, and about current use of acid reducing medications such as proton pump inhibitor, because it's very it was very important to us to know is the erosive esophagitis responsive to medical therapy? Because in a preoperative cohort where you have just erosive esophagitis with normal anatomy, rates of healing of erosive esophagitis on medications like PPI should be in excess of 90%. And that's, that's one thing that we wanted to collect data on. So the primary outcome was the presence of esophagitis uh, graded based on the LA grade criteria from A, B being mild to moderate and C and D are indicative of uh, severe esophagitis. As I told you then, we collected information about the presence of hiatal hernia because that's as an important confounder in the anti-reflux story as I showed you before. So this is the baseline demographics for the entire cohort, uh, 517 patients included, 261 sleeve gastrectomy, 256 row -wide gastric bypass. Uh, the row -wide gastric bypass tended to be a bit uh, older than the sleeve gastrectomy cohort. Uh, similar percentages, uh, slightly uh, more predominance of female in the row -wide gastric bypass compared to sleeve. Uh, BMI at the time of uh, BMI at the time of endoscopy was uh, similar in both cohorts, uh, and uh, there was a uh, the 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 what's what's this the other difference is uh, time to endoscopy is was longer in the row y gastric bypass cohort compared to the sleeve gastrectomy. And that's because of the nature that row y gastric bypass is an older procedure. We did adjust for this in the multivariate analysis that I will share with you as well. Pre-existing GERD diagnosis was present in a similar percentage of uh, both groups. Uh, 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 and uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, was used in a similar percentage of both groups as well, uh, as you could see from here. So PPI was prevalent and almost two thirds of the cohort in both ends were using these medications. So uh, if we look uh, on the prevalence of erosive esophagitis on upper endoscopy, uh, and uh, that is uh, basically one of the major findings here, is that you could see that 
uh, as a cohort, co uh, the complete cohort, there was about 27% prevalence of erosive esophagitis. If you now divide this into the different procedures, you could see that the prevalence of erosive esophagitis was 37.5% in the sleeve gastrectomy cohort compared to 17.4% in the Roa gastric bypass cohort. So the, the, the prevalence of erosive esophagitis is higher than sleeve gastrectomy, but it's not trivial after Roa gastric bypass neither, uh, because we've been associating Roa gastric bypass as an anti-reflux procedure. That means you expect erosive esophagitis to be almost zero. And here we're, we're seeing about 17.4% incidence of erosive esophagitis uh, in this uh, cohort. If you broke down both the mild or severe forms of the erosive esophagitis, you could see that the story persists. Uh, sleeve gastrectomy was uh, associated with higher prevalence of both mild and severe erosive esophagitis, uh, and, and the severe esophagitis was present in 10.7% of the sleeve cohort versus 3% of the ROI gastric bypass cohort. Now, if you look at the consequences of reflux and you look at Barrett's, you could see that Barrett's was found in a higher percentage after Roa gastric bypass. Uh, this could be a, a, a biased finding because, as you know, uh, people with Barrett's are offered Roa gastric bypass preferentially as a better control of reflux. And that's why we're seeing in this cohort probably higher prevalence of Barrett's esophagus in row -wide gastric bypass compared to the sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, but this is the data as, as, as it is. Now, as I told you, use of PPI at the time of endoscopy and the presence of hiatal hernias are both important confounder here. Uh, time to endoscopy from surgery is an important confounder. And why is time an important confounder? Because what happens is with time, the anatomic impact on the GE junction physiology and the motility of the esophagus increases. So the more time that goes by after bariatric surgery, you then speed that the reflux is going to worsen because there's a phenomena where the esophagus is going to tire uh, from the uh, chronic increase in afterload from the from the procedure and the motility of the esophagus is going to alter and time is an important variable here. So if you look at this association, which is in yellow, you could see on univariate analysis that the sleeve gastrectomy was associated with 2.8 increased odds of reflux esophagitis compared to rho y gastric uh, bypass. Now, we adjusted for a different confounders that you're seeing here, but the two confounders that it's important to notice, we adjust to the hiatal hernia at the time of endoscopy, and we adjusted for PPI use at the time of endoscopy, and we adjusted for time to, to, to surgery. And you could see that even with all these adjustments, this association between sleeve gastrectomy and worsening sleeve, uh, reflux esophagitis is maintained with an odds ratio of 2.47%. But as you could see, independent of the operation, the presence of hiatal hernia itself is associated with increased uh, reflux esophagitis uh, as well. So, now we're going to switch gear to the to the second uh, part where we took a cohort of sleeve gastrectomy patients who had upper endoscopy, who had esophageal manometry, and and match it to a preoperative obese cohort that also had an upper endoscopy and also had a manometry, and we end up having about 40 patients in each arm. Uh, and here you could see, obviously, which is also important, that the sleeve gastrectomy cohort had a much lower BMI than the preoperative control. So, so the 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 deck is stacked in favor of surgery here because you took away part, a significant uh, impact of obesity because these patients lost. Uh, about 10 points BMI after the procedure. So, so this is more in favor of bariatric surgery compared to the preoperative cohort. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you could see that the PPI use in both cohorts was similar and about 80% uh, in both cohorts was on medication. 
If you then took this cohort and you look about the prevalence of erosive esophagitis, you could still, still see, similar to our larger study, that 31% of the cohort had erosive esophagitis. And similar to the reported literature, you could see that about 13% of the preoperative obese cohort have also erosive esophagitis. So sleeve gastrectomy have an additional uh, increased prevalence of erosive esophagitis on top of what you're seeing in obesity uh, itself. The more important finding is, is below is what happened to these uh, physiological uh, changes of the esophageal, lower esophageal uh, sphincter uh, and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the motility of the esophagus. Uh, albeit this is at only and at a median of about two years after surgery, so you expect these, these physiological alterations to worsen with time. You could see compared to obesity alone, the lower resting esophageal pressure was almost half of that in obesity, which is a significant finding. That means that the sphincter is becoming weaker from the increased afterload that it's seeing from the sleeve gastrectomy. So the resting pressure was 21 in the sleeve gastrectomy cohort, compared to about 40 in, uh, in obesity uh, itself. Then you could start seeing a hint that the esophagus is getting weaker with time. And the measure here is this distal contact contractility integer uh, on manometry. What simply that stating is that's the force of pushing a bolus in the esophagus. And you could see that the, this maximal force of pushing a bolus in the esophagus is, 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 is significantly lower uh, in sleeve gastrectomy compared to a preoperative uh, control. So we're seeing impact on the door itself, which is the lower esophageal sphincter, and impact on the clearance of the esophagus uh, as well. Uh, could, that could explain this discrepancy in the incidence or the prevalence of erosive esophagitis of sleeve, after sleeve gastrectomy compared to the control. Now, this graph looks at the prevalence of erosive esophagitis broken down by PPI use and by the presence of hiatal hernia, okay? So here you could see this is presence of hiatal hernia and people who are on PPI. The orange is sleeve gastrectomy and the green is row gastric bypass. Here you could see that the cohort with no hiatal hernia uh, and, or, and on PPI, and this is the cohort that has no hiatal hernia and are not on PPI at the time of endoscopy. So this is the most purest cohort here because that eliminates the use of PPI impact and the impact of hiatal hernia presence. And you could see that the prevalence of erosive esophagitis was at 27% compared to 7.4% after RUI gastric bypass. So it's, it's very important to notice that presence of hiatal hernia and low gastric bypass contributes significantly uh, to the uh, reason that we're seeing reflux after low gastric bypass. It also contributes after sleeve gastrectomy, but it seems to, to be to, uh, toward a lesser degree. Now, this is an important cohort as well here because that shows you the impact of PPI uh, use uh, and you could see that, that despite the use of PPI, which I told you in, in, in a normal anatomy cohort, PPI should heal re reflux esophagitis in the majority of patients. Here you could see that despite PPI use, there was still significant amount of reflux esophagitis documented on endoscopy, indicating that the physiology of reflux uh, is quite different compared to what we're used to in a normal anatomy a cohort and indicating that PPI use by itself might not be uh, enough to impact the consequences of reflux after, uh, after these uh, operations. So uh, there's limitation, of course, in the study, and uh, that's why we try to compensate to the, to the limitation of the cross-sectional study by doing a case match cohort that take a deeper dive in the, uh, 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 into this. But the, bigger, the biggest limitations that we have in the study is there's no prevalence of preoperative esophagitis uh, in the cross-sectional cohort. Uh, we did not uh, include all comers. That means you had to have a reason to get an endoscopy, to get an endoscopy. Uh, so some of the asymptomatic cohort was not included. 
but th that tells us that we probably are underestimating even this because if you include all comers, things might look different, but that's a question to be answered in a more prospective fashion. And the final limitation is the short interval uh, to endoscopy. It was two years compared to about eight years after Roa gastric bypass. So the odds were stacked against Roa gastric bypass because there was more time to develop these cha changes. And one wonders what happens if we repeat this analysis five years from now, do we see something different? And uh, that, that, to, uh, that remains to be answered. But in conclusion, Increased prevalence of erosive esophagitis after sleeve gastrectomy uh, was documented uh, in, in this cohort compared to OY gastric bypass. We have some uh, insights into why this is happening, and we're showing that there is impact on the lower esophageal sphincter physiology and on the contractility of the esophagus that could be conducive to this reflux phenomena uh, seen after uh, these interventions. Uh, the physiology of GERD in post-surgical anatomy or post-bariatric surgical anatomy is slightly different than we see in normal anatomy. Uh, and PPI, though, is used ubiqu ubiquitously, might not be uh, sufficient alone to address this issue. Uh, ero uh, erosive esophagitis and Barrett's esophagus was still seen after Roa gastric bypass. So, I, so we cannot just say, though Roa gastric bypass significantly improved reflux, we cannot say that it's a cure for reflux and vigilance in screening patients for reflux and the consequences of reflux after Roa gastric bypass is warranted. And finally, we need better tools to screen patients at high risk of developing GERD in order to personalize the procedure choice uh, down the line on who gets what kind of bariatric procedure, because obviously bariatric procedure does, uh, or bariatric surgery does save life. And this, is, does not, this uh, study is not uh, in any way or form designed to scare people about bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is still uh, impact mor mortality and morbidity. We just need to have better patient selection in order to minimize uh, the consequences of some of the risks that we see. Uh, uh, and uh, overall, still with these findings, uh, still uh, there's, again, I, we, we did not have any documentation of adenocarcinoma, uh, except in one case, which was a few years after Roa gastric bypass. So, uh, so uh, to put this in context, uh, these findings uh, ye have not yet correlated with increased prevalence of cancer uh, in, in, in this cohort. Uh, with that being said, I would like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues uh, who uh, were instrumental in performing the study, uh, especially uh, Reem Matar, who uh, was the first author on this work, and she did the lion's share of the data collection uh, and, and analysis, along with my co-investigator, Dr. Kellogg, uh, from uh, our bariatric surgery team uh, and uh, other colleagues uh, you see on the manuscript. Thank you for your kind attention, and we'll open it for questions. Thank you very much, Raham, for your outstanding work and presentation. Congratulations to all your teams. Now the audience questions are open. Please type them, and I will read them. In the meantime, I would like to ask you, do you consider the appendoscopy previous to every bariatric surgery mandatory? Uh, Pedro, I, I really, th I used to be on the fence on this question, but I do think it's mandatory. I think it's crucial because we know that these procedures impact the physiology of reflux. And, and, and at least at minimum, documenting your baseline physiology, that means do you have Barrett's? Do you have reflux esophagitis as baseline? Do you have hiatal hernia? Do you, uh, do, and what's the hell grade of your valve? Is this valve competent or incompetent? These are all important factors that at minimum will be conducive to a better surveillance program after surgery, but hopefully they could steer the decision on of one bariatric surgery versus the other. Uh, so I think uh, preoperative endoscopy should be mandatory on everybody contemplating bariatric surgery. Great. Um, on the question, when do you consider appendoscopy follow-up necessary? 
I mean, in blue and white, the slick gastrectomy patient. And how often do you need to do that? Yeah. I mean, every year, every year. I don't know. So uh, thank you for that question. I don't think we have answered this. We are at the level of now starting to seeing these associations and uh, we do not want to, to recommend an interval that's not realistic, but I think until we get a better data is the interval uh, of repeat upper endoscopy should be governed by your preoperative findings. For example, if you have preoperative findings of Barrett's, depending on the degree of dysplasia of Barrett's, that might necessitate a more close follow-up or treatment algorithm after the, uh, the surgery. If you have esophagitis, then I would be more vigilant about postoperative surveillance. If everything was normal, I think, my, in my opinion, and I, I don't think this is driven by data, is one-time evaluation at a two-year interval after the procedure to document what's the changes uh, at this time point after this procedure uh, is helpful. But again, this is personal opinion than driven by, by data at this point. Perfect. Uh, we are waiting for questions. So it's open. Uh, other question? What physiology mechanism occur after um, bariatrophal after ruined white gas bypass? Yes. Uh, this is this is actually an area of intense research that we're conducting right now because we find this this finding to be very interesting. Uh, we have have said that robot gastric bypass could be a cure for reflux, uh, and there's multiple good reason why this could be the case. You're removing a significant uh, mass of the parietal cells that produces acid after robot gastric bypass, uh, and you're diverting the bile away uh, as well. So. So we were surprised to still find significant reflux esophagitis after row y gastric bypass. That's why we're now conducting more physiological studies after row y gastric bypass to try to understand this phenomena better. But the potential candidate why we're seeing reflux after row y gastric bypass is that uh, despite removing significant mass of the parietal cell, there is, a, there is a phenomena of hypercompensation of whatever parietal cells remaining in that pouch that you're still having a weakly acidic uh, or alkaline reflux. And that could be, uh, that could be uh, one of the reasons uh, that we're seeing reflux uh, after uh, Roa gastric bypass. The other reason is that the pouch compliance is significant to altering the angle of his and altering the interaction with even a small or trivial hiatal hernia. And what we're seeing that, that's why we're seeing there's a huge confounding by the presence of even a small hiatal hernia after OI gastric bypass and the incidence of reflux that render the GE junction almost useless in this phenomena. And it's uh, even weakly acidic pockets in this pouch could cause significant uh, reflux. But much to come on this because this is an area that we're actively uh, investigating and studying. Perfect. One question for Wabi. Uh, do you expect to see erosive esophagitis with patients post endoscopy sleep? So we, we thought that we would, but so far the data, uh, at least from the Hopkins group uh, that looked at this systematically, did not see increased reflux esophagitis after uh, the endoscopic sleeve. And you could argue about why this is the case. Probably one of the bigger reasons this is the case is we're not messing around with the angle of his too much. Uh, the sleeve is uh, is fully innervated, and and uh, if you look at the contractility of the endoscopic sleeve, is fully intact. So it has not been proven to be a high pressure system. So more data is needed. This is I don't think we have answered this question fully, but as far as we uh, tell right now, is uh, endoscopic sleeve has not been shown to increase uh, reflux uh, post-operatively, but for sure more data is warranted and needed. 
Perfect. Other question. Uh, after how much time was patient scheduled for appendectomy after bariatric surgery? Yes. So the median time in the raw gastric bypass cohort was about eight years. The median time after the sleeve gastrectomy cohort was about two years. Uh, so that's that's the, the that's the average time after the procedures. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, uh, no question for here. Uh, what is your last message for our professional bariatric community? So the last message here, and again, I would emphasize this, uh, it's important to put these results in context. Uh, bariatric surgery is still the treatment modality of choice for obesity. It does alter a lot of the comorbidity associated with obesity, and it does alter uh, significantly the mortality uh, that comes with the disease of obesity. Uh, however, it's very important to also be vigilant about potential impact on, 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 on adverse events uh, that uh, could impact the physiology of the, uh, of the esophagus and GE junction. And rather than saying uh, we need to be scared from it, it's just we just need to be vigilant and screen our patients appropriately, preoperatively and postoperatively in order to prevent the complications of reflux and in order to channel the right patient to the right operation. Uh, and we, since we have multiple good operations, such as the sleeve gastrectomy and the Roy gastric bypass, it's important to really uh, look at this uh, uh, in a more systematic fashion and, and have everybody uh, take a look at the, uh, the anatomy preoperatively and have a surveillance program postoperatively as well. Perfect. Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we'll see you the next week. We have all the journal club. Thank you right. very much. Thank you, Pedro. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.